Hello everyone and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 18th of June. I hope here in the UK all those who are listening are managing to stay dry today uh, because we have had the most torrential ongoing rain that doesn't seem to have stopped since a massive thunderstorm started yesterday afternoon. For those of you who were tuning in yesterday afternoon, I was doing a live uh, Reading Greek Tragedy Online session with the Centre for Hellenic Studies in Washington and out of Chaos Theatre and we were reading Euripides Ion and in the background as we were talking about Delphi and the might and wrath of the god Apollo, there was thunder coming in on the background of my live Zoom feed. So it couldn't have been more appropriate, but by golly, I too, for one, and I'm sure you're the same, would rather this rain now stop. Anyway, I hope you're staying dry. I hope wherever you are in the rest of the world, you are having uh, a fantastic and better weather experience, and indeed also that you are all safe and well, uh, and uh, that you are all beginning to feel the restrictions lift a little in different ways at different stages in different parts of the world. I'm enviously hearing about people in Greece now able to go on holiday and they've been off to the islands to Mykonos etc very very envious of that here in the UK we can't still uh, stay away from our homes overnight but fingers crossed not too far thank you all so much for joining hello Sarah hello Paul um, I've got Paul I've got 25 minutes until the lemon sponge cakes are ready my god we better make this a good 25 minutes for you Paul thank you so much everyone for joining in um, just a, a quick reminder of course of not just the Facebook page as always but our new Facebook community group the first of Michael Scott Classics community group great number of members in they're discussing topics away I hope that continues strongly and of course don't forget the topics surrounding particular sites uh, that we were talking about in in previous weeks they will come up uh, we'll be bringing that discussion back into our Q&A's in future weeks uh, when we focus on particular uh, sites and locations around the ancient world um, I hope also you had a chance to enjoy some of the extra live uh, readings that I've been doing of Ancient Greek Tragedy, the ones chosen by you guys over the past month or so uh, that are up on the YouTube channel. So both the live ones that I did last week and there are, of course, four additional new readings that I've put up on the YouTube channel uh, this week and they've been going live each day. So we had Euripides Medea on Tuesday, Plato's Apology on Wednesday, today Sophocles's Ajax and tomorrow to finish it off a bit of Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. So do hope uh, that you're enjoying those live readings. It's been great fun to do and a quick announcement that next week, next Friday, uh, if you remember back to when I first started doing these, it was in conjunction with the Actors of Dionysus and their Daily Dose of Culture over Twitter and that next Friday will be their hundredth Daily Dose uh, of Culture and I'll be joining them again to do another reading on Twitter then. So keep an eye out for that. Um, in the meantime, we've had tons and tons of great questions in coming in over the last couple of weeks about the Silk Road. So I wanted to try and gather those together and talk about them within one concentrated Q&A to think about the ways in which the Mediterranean world that we are more familiar with, perhaps, connected into and was influenced and influenced uh, the other parts of the ancient Silk Road network. So we're thinking about the empires of Asia, of India and of China. Um, so kind of, uh, we will be getting some of those great questions in a moment. And there's also tons of news and what's on activities, which is another sign that the whole world is coming back to life uh, post-COVID-19. But to begin with, there's a question that's been vexing you all. And it's come in from a number of people. And I have a horrible feeling that it may be something to do with this clock behind me. Uh, so people like JB and Lee Edmund have been asking about how to write the Roman numeral four, because if you start looking at clocks, clock faces and watch faces, which so often use the Roman numerals, you may find that actually, while most of them are all the same, four and nine uh, are do interchange between, as example on the clock behind me here, the IV, the contracted form, sort of one minus five, and then the contracted form of nine, one minus 10. But you can also see on watch faces and on clock faces uh, for four, four individual strokes, so just one more than the three, and indeed for nine, you see V for five and then four individual strokes uh, to get you up to nine. And the question has come in from you very, very uh, eagle-eyed people is kind of, so which is the way to write it and, and who's right and who's wrong? Well, both of you. Both everyone is right, whether you're writing uh, four strokes for four or IV for four. Those are both Roman numerals and they've both been in use with IV sort of becoming the more common usage, I guess. But actually only since relatively recently in the ancient Roman world itself, there seems to have been a bit of a preference for using one, two, three, four strokes for four and V, one, two, three, four strokes for nine. And that's partly because we think 
that the way you wrote the name Jupiter in, in, in Latin, particularly in capital letters, started with I, which was the Latin for J, if we all remember back to our Indiana Jones uh, kind of movie when he kind of, he's, uh, he's, uh, uh, is, he's going across that floor and he's got to cross and use the letters uh, that are stable and the other ones he'll fall to his doom and he makes a mistake because in Latin, the J is an I. Remember this people, it may save your life in the future. So I, um, but then uh, the capital U is actually written uh, as a V. So the first two letters of the name Jupiter, the king of the gods in Latin, were I-V, which would look like four. Uh, and there is some indication that perhaps the Romans were a little bit circumspect and a bit worried about uh, using I-V, the first two letters of Jupiter's name, uh, as a numeral. Uh, and so it was safer uh, to use four bars. And similarly, uh, kind of, although it doesn't quite work, does it, for nine uh, either. Um, so, so, we're not quite sure, but in inevitable, there were definitively these two different ways of uh, writing uh, four and nine, uh, and both of you are right. And if you have a look at some clocks, choose to, sometimes they really mix and match it up, particularly on watch faces. So sometimes for four, you'll have the four bars, but for nine, you'll have the contracted form of IX. Um, so uh, a lot of it is to do with actually what the balance of the clock and watch face feels like, um, as you have the numbers, and particularly depending on where you put the time and date indicator etc etc so it doesn't really have a that much to do with the ancient world at all but there you go because i know it's been really upsetting you guys for quite some weeks worrying about um four and nine uh, so thanks very much indeed for asking about those questions but to kick off on our Silk Roads exploration. Right, we had Andrew Jeffrey asking, it'd be great to have a discussion about ships and particularly navigating in the ancient world. Did people go boating for pleasure or was it just for transport and cargo? <coughs> well, Andrew, thank you <clears throat> for this question because it brilliantly gets us into the idea of engagement over long distances between cultures. Now, within the Mediterranean, we know there was an awful lot of boating going on from the earliest times. Uh, and the, really quite some of the extraordinary moments in the development of Mediterranean history are when people build up the courage, the confidence, the expertise, the experience, the technological know-how to strike out, not just following the coastline, but actually striking out across open sea over large distances. And these are often really key moments moments of interconnection and development of ancient societies. Um, as we get into the kind of historical periods that we have lots of written sources about, we also hear about the great explorers, people like Pythaeus coming from Marseille, ancient Massalia, who headed out of the Mediterranean in his ship and went up and explored around the whole of Britain, uh, dropping himself off at the tin mines of Cornwall before going even further north, north in the, where he met ice flows uh, in the sea where it was turning to ice, and then he went to explore the Baltic Sea around Scandinavia as well. So we hear about great expeditions uh, taking place in ships. There was obviously tons of trade and cargo moving all about the Mediterranean in different forms of ships as well. And some of the Black Sea projects, which you may have been familiar with, they've been using all sorts of laser and clever, clever technology to scan all the shipwrecks that are at the bottom of the Black Sea that are in impeccable condition because of the conditions, the salt uh, water conditions down there, which means that you can see pretty much intact vessels that were churning through the Black Sea coming down through uh, the Bosphorus uh, into the Sea of Marmara, through the Hellespont into the Aegean, just as the oil tankers do today. So we've got that going on as well. Of course, there would be local uh, boating going on as well. I mean, think about dear old Pliny getting on his boat in the Bay of Naples on the day of the Pompeii eruption and single-handedly with a couple of people to row him properly, going, I want to go and have a look at this a bit closer up. Uh, obviously, didn't work very well for him because he then died. Um, but clearly, lots of people who were living around the coast had their own boats under their own power steam to go off and do what they want. Local fishing as well going on. And we also hear about tales of people who have hitched transport lifts that they need to get from one place to another, for either for pleasure or perhaps to go and see family at far distances and they sort of jump on trading vessels or other kind of vessels that are moving around the ancient world as well. Um, and then of course you might want to think about traveling further afield 
field outside of the Mediterranean. And here from the first century AD, we get a very, very strong picture of a new route opening up in the time of the Emperor Augustus, leaving from the Egyptian ports uh, on the Red Sea, places like Berenice, uh, and heading down the Red Sea through the Persian Gulf, and then out across the Indian Ocean. And it was in the early first century AD that apparently the Roman traders, or the traders moving out of Egypt under the Roman period, learned how to sail the monsoon winds all the way to India, and then come back again with the reverse monsoon winds. Um, so from that point onwards, something like 120 ships a year were making this journey to the ports of India, to places like Baragaza, to trade there and bring all the goods of the Silk Roads back with them to India, uh, from India to Egypt, where they were then taxed, of course, by the Romans and then transported on other ships um, around the Mediterranean. We also hear about Roman traders in their ships making it around um, the southern tip of India, Sri Lanka, uh, up the east coast of India, there's kind of uh, archaeological evidence for Roman traders having some sort of trading emporium um, on the east coast of India, at Pondicherry. Um, but then equally, there seems to be uh, evidence for Roman trading ships getting to what we now consider to be Monde Vietnam as well. Um, so really quite extensive sailing and navigating going on around the ancient world. Um, Sarah's asking about what about Cleopatra's perfume barge? Yes, and then there were the, the celebrated boats of antiquity like Cleopatra's, but also one of my personal favorites favourites belonged to a tyrant in um, Sicily who, renowned for their luxury and kind of over-the-topness, had one of the biggest single ships ever built in antiquity. This was like something to rival the big, massive floating cruise ships that we see today that can hold 3,000 people. This thing had like a garden on it uh, and a gymnasium and a kind of all sorts of internal structures as well. Um, so there were these magnificent ships that had been built. Um, how far they actually went and, and so whether they were used as much as they were there to really just show off how big is my ship, um, we'll never be quite sure. So Andrew, thank you very much indeed for that question. Then we had a question come in from Stella Gold, who was asking about how much did the Achaemenid Empire impact Rome? Now, this is, um, some of you may have been following the great BBC4 series that has started on the art of Persia, started this week, continuing over the next couple of weeks. Absolutely brilliant. Do check that in because they've got unparalleled access to the wonders uh, that are hidden in modern day Iran and really, really worth um, seeing. And of course, the, that's where they're seeing their Persian heritage on the Iranians seeing coming from, the Achaemenid Empire um, that was really formed around 550 BC, running through until the 330s BCE. And those are the rulers, the people who interfere with the Greeks. So that's like King Darius, who invaded at the Battle of Marathon, and then of course Xerxes, who Battle of Salamis and Plataea, and before them both, of course, the great founder Cyrus, um, the man who kind of put it all together, as it were. Um, now, the Achaemenid Empire uh, dies out because of Alexander the Great uh, coming in and literally taking it over, defeating uh, the Achaemenid monarch. Um, and it, then, after Alexander the Great's death, that whole swathe of land becomes a uh, one of the Hellenistic empires, and particularly the Seleucid Empire. So it becomes a sort of Greco-Persian uh, sort of mix and match, if you like. Um, but then there is the Parthian Empire that emerges from that. So Parthia starts off as one small bit of the Seleucid Empire that breaks away and then expands massively to take control of the entire Seleucid Empire. And you get the Parthians as a very, very, very strong empire. And those are the people who come up really against the Romans. So the Roman Empire we can think of as growing in the Mediterranean from the 4th century BC onwards. It's really got kind of uh, pretty much wide Mediterranean control after the middle of the 2nd century BCE, particularly 146 BCE is a really important date, the destruction of Corinth by the Romans and Greece expanding into the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so kind of by the time you get to um, the end of the second century and into the first century BC, the time of the Roman Republic, you really have got these two empires, the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, fully functioning and powerful, and they're beginning to butt heads. Um, and kind of that will continue. And so, Stella, your question about how much did the empires of that part of Asia really impact on Rome? Really, it's the Parthians um, that start to have a major impact on Rome. And then their successor empire after the Parthians, which 
changeover happens in the early third century AD CE, so after 224, and that's the arrival of the Sassanid Empire, which is another great moment um, in modern Iranian ancient Persian history. Uh, but one thing that really interests me and that I've been writing about at the moment is thinking about what happens on the Roman Parthian border in particularly the last centuries BC and the first centuries AD uh, because that is where great communities like that we now know the names of very well Palmyra uh, were based. Now Palmyra obviously we know in the news for a whole so it's a sad much sadder reasons more recently um, but it was an incredibly important rich powerful caravan trading site sitting in the desert um, really on the Roman Parthian border uh, and as a result its community was a crazy fusion uh, of uh, influence of people, of, of, of actual kind of uh, national identities, people moving across this very hard geopolitical border between the Romans and the Parthians, different religious worlds, different political worlds, different rulership, and they were often at war with one another. But for the purposes of trade, it was actually a much more diffuse border, and people were able to move backwards and forwards as part of the network of the early Silk Roads. So you could either sail your ship from the Egyptian ports like Berenice across the Indian Ocean and get to the Indian ports of Baragaza et al. that way and get the goods of the Silk Roads, but there were also land routes that were coming through the Parthian Empire uh, and then crossing over into the Roman world at places like Palmyra and other Roman Parthian border posts, places like Zygma, places like Jura Europos, um, and then equally they were coming in further north as well, sort of over the Caspian Sea and then down into the Black Sea. So there were lots of land routes through which this trade was emerging into the Mediterranean world and connecting as well. And Palmyra, as a result, ends up being this real cosmopolitan hodgepodge um, of uh, there are people in Palmyra who are dressing like Romans, they're in their togas, uh, but there were equally, we see particularly from the funerary uh, art uh, that's created on the sort of tombstones of Palmyrenes, that there were Palmyrenes who were choosing to dress like Parthians and particularly Parthian kings. So they start wearing the rather trendy Parthian king trouser suit and caftan look, um, kind of particularly in luxurious uh, locations such as when they're at banquets. Now this kind of clothing had actually emerged long, long, long before uh, across vast parts of Central Asia because it was a very comfortable thing to wear when you're riding horses trousers are. Uh, so it was a very useful utilitarian clothing. But really by the first century CE this is, seems to have been adopted by Parthian kings as their kind of preferred luxury costume and it's at that moment that these Palmarines or these some Palmarines seem to have adopted this costume as well in luxury moments like at the banquet when you certainly weren't going to be riding any horses. Uh, so kind of you've got this wonderful fusion going across and you also obviously see people in Palmyra moving backwards and forwards to sites within the Parthian world, uh, trading networks zooming backwards and forwards, Palmarines being dependent on people living in Parthian towns to be able to protect their caravan trade, moving through the desert from desert raids, etc. So it's a real cosmopolitan mix on this borderline uh, between Rome and Parthia. So Stella, in answer to your question, how much did Parthian or the, the Asian empires affect Rome? Rome hugely um, and they may have even potentially we hear from the Chinese sources have stopped China from directly interacting with Rome because in the Chinese historical sources the Hanshun Hu Hanshun it talks about the fact that Chinese uh, traders and embassies were often trying to get further west uh, in order to connect with this world that they knew, Da Qin, kind of which we think of as, as the Roman world, the Mediterranean world, and it was the people of Anxi, as they're known in the Chinese records, the Parthians, who said, no, 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 don't you worry about it. It's far too far away for you to be able to get there yourselves. Leave us to be the middlemen um, so that we can uh, move uh, the goods for you between the two. And so it's recorded in the sources that the Parthians consistently um, stymie and stop the Chinese from getting any further, uh, including uh, sort of lying to them about quite how far the Mediterranean world uh, away uh, really was away. Um, and as a result, maintain their lucrative position as middlemen uh, between the Chinese and the, and the Romans with all the trade going backwards and forwards. So Stella, thank you so much for that question. Right, we're gonna have to stop briefly to talk about some of the amazing things um, that have been going on. And then Sarah, I want to come back to your question about fashion uh, to, to end up with. So 
we've had tons of news coming in. I love this stuff from Vindolanda. And Vindolanda an amazing site anyway. But it turns out that a family has actually been making it their lockdown home. So Sonia and Colin Galloway, uh, who both work for the trust uh, that runs Vindolanda Fort, at the beginning of lockdown, left the home in Hexham to live at the fort. Um, they thought they and their sons, two teenage boys, would only be there for a couple of weeks. They've now been there for 11 weeks, sweeping bathhouses, protecting artefacts from the wind, and most crucially, from badger damage. Those devilish badgers. Well, to Sonia, to Colin, to Carl Oliver and Luke, Fab, fab, fab work and long may it continue, although hopefully you'll be getting some help very, very soon. Um, in, in looking back to the heat wave, and wouldn't we in the UK love a heat wave today with the rain, back uh, that happened in 2018 across Wales, well, since all the drought and, and uh, that occurred because of that heat wave, there were scorched crop marks which allowed the uncovering, the seeing for the first time of around 200 ancient sites across Wales that we didn't know existed. Right, so there are even positives to come out of droughts and heat waves. Um, and we've discovered also, uh, kind of, and you may have been following this a little bit because it's been in The Guardian and, and other places, that in Italy, they have, using the latest ground, ground penetrating radar technology, been able to map an entire Roman city that's underground without digging a single bit of it. Now this is incredibly exciting because they've actually been able to use the new levels of technology to look at different levels under the ground and thus get a sense of how the city itself underground changed and was built on over time. So it's not one monolithic picture, it's actually layers of picture of how this city um, has grown up, which is absolutely brilliant to see. At Pompeii, the great discoveries just keep on going and the site is now newly open again, so to get to if you're able to get to there. Uh, Massimo Asana has talked about the fact they've unearthed a covered walkway, a painted vault uh, near the villa of Civita Giuliana, which is going to be absolutely beautiful when we get to see some pictures of this. Um, ancient Roman board games have been found in Norwegian burial sites. So again, this speaks to this wider connectivity than we're used to thinking about. The Mediterranean was not an isolated closed box. Um, these uh, burial, uh, these Roman board games, they're sort of 18 game chip pieces, elongated dice, etc., um, that are dating to around 300 AD, 300 CE, and are speaking to the much greater connection between the Roman world and the Scandinavian world in this period. So not only should we think about connections going east through to the Silk Roads, but actually north up into the Baltic, as well as, of course, much more coming down south into Africa as well. Um, and then this, I thought, was particularly good use of the ancient world for the modern world. You may remember a little while ago, we talked about the fact that a team of researchers have actually recreated the face of an 11-year-old Athenian called Myrtis, who died of plague in Athens um, back in the 5th century BC. Right, uh, now Myrtis is kind of, it's not just sitting there pretty and happy about having been recreated. Myrtis has been put to use in the co-fight against COVID-19 uh, and she has been animated uh, into a, uh, a little video that has been translated into English, Norwegian, Finnish, Arabic and Chinese. Myrtis is very, very, very much a polyglot um, in which Myrtis advises viewers to listen to the experts on COVID-19 and follow their instructions Otherwise, you're going to end up a little bit like her. Uh, kind of, I think, excellent use of the ancient world to improve uh, the modern. Right, uh, and now uh, some what's, what's coming up. So uh, some of you may be aware that tonight uh, on BBC4 at 10 p.m. they're re-showing my uh, series uh, Ancient Invisible Cities and we're going to Cairo. Um, so absolutely brilliant, working with scan lab projects to laser scan and then create in 3D and virtual reality some of the extraordinary locations from Cairo's ancient Egyptian past all the way through to uh, that of Saladin. Uh, so brilliant, brilliant uh, episode. So much fun to make. I'm really looking forward to uh, being reminded about that. And then next uh, Tuesday, the 23rd of June, they're also showing the Athens episode from Ancient Invisible Cities on BBC4 at 9pm. Um, so some good stuff to watch there. And do remember that Scan Labs are doing a brilliant uh, series of pictures that you can buy at the moment of some of their scans from these different series, Invisible Rome, Italy's Invisible Cities, Ancient Invisible Cities, uh, and you can see the link through to their online shop there as well. Rome's Invisible City still on iPlayer if you haven't had a chance to catch it up. Next week on the 24th of June, I'm going to be giving an online 
online lecture uh, for the British School at Athens summer lecture. This is free to register for, but you do have to register for it in advance to get a place. Um, and then you'll be sent a Zoom link to join. So you can find the Zoom link on the Facebook page or on my Twitter feed. Uh, so do, 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 if you haven't had a chance to sign up, it's 6 p.m. UK time, 8 p.m. Greek time, uh, and what does that make it? 1, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so uh, kind of do join me for that. We're going to be talking again about the world of interconnectivity uh, of the uh, the first centuries, first, second, third centuries, CE, but very much the view from Greece. So what did Greece understand and experience of this bigger, much, much bigger, wider world stretching all the way to China, of which it, of which it was now a connected part uh, and I'm hoping to bring you some rather uh, unusual and unheard of stories um, from uh, the Greek perspective from those periods. Our Warwick Classics Network, of course, continues a bit, but we have had to delay a number of the events so that we can hold them, we hope, in person. So our Teacher's Day, uh, Classical Civilization Teacher's Day, has been moved through to the 11th of November. So do get in touch if you'd like to be part of that. And our Ancient World Study Day for school kids is going to be put uh, from November uh, this year through to March 2021. So keep an eye on that. Um, don't forget those live tragedy uh, recordings I've been doing on YouTube um, and also uh, homeschool history. I hope you were able to tune in this week. Greg Jenner and I were working together on an episode on gladiators. Uh, there's going to be a new You Dead to Me episode on Don't Tell Anyone, the Battle of Salamis uh, coming up soon. Uh, and I'm also going to be doing a couple more podcasts uh, that will be recorded and released um, over the next couple of weeks. If you're interested in thinking about ancient drama, um, we've also just released a podcast done with the Archive of Greek and Roman Performance here at Oxford. Um, and uh, that was done with myself and Chella Ward uh, talking about uh, uh, performances of ancient Greek tragedy in very, very different parts of the world in America and China. So that's free to listen to as well wherever you get your podcast. The dates uh, links are on the website. Um, and one of my students at Warwick, Dylan Patel, has been putting his time to very good use post uh, his exams and he's developed a whole new blog page a blog page called classics grad and this is for people who have done classics at some point in their lives but not necessarily carried it on post their degrees undergraduate degrees or in school to post their own individual thoughts and ideas and reflections on the classical world as they go about their multifaceted careers in all sorts of subjects so you join as a member to this website and you can put up your post so i would encourage you all to do that do support dylan and um, go and have a look at uh, that website and again the link is on the Facebook page. There are going to be Royal Mail stamps commemorating Roman Britain coming out soon, which I think is absolutely fabulous. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of those. Now we have just a minute or two uh, to talk about Sarah Scotty's question. These days, fashions change per season, she says. How much did they change through the Roman era? What were the style influences? Was there a Roman Stella McCartney? Excellent. So sorry, thanks very much for talking about that because actually, ironically enough, I have just been writing about fashion in antiquity, global fashion trends in antiquity um, for a new edited volume, the Cambridge um, Global History of Fashion. Uh, and so I've been thinking a little bit about this. Um, and within the kind of Roman world, one of the most famous examples uh, that we've talked about, I think a little bit at different points in the past, but again, connects into the Silk Road's idea is silk, the arrival of silk. Now we know that within the Mediterranean world, there were fashion trends um, and they were often based on when new materials came into the Mediterranean that suddenly made a new type of clothing uh, available or possible, or you could make the same kind of clothing but of a different material. Uh, if something was extremely expensive because of the technological innovation that it took to be able to produce or the sheer amount of work time that it took to be able to produce, that was often a highly then desirable fashion item as well. Um, and so Silk and colour purple came together quite often with this. So purple was one of the most expensive colours in the ancient Mediterranean world because it took 10,000 sea snail glands excreted and crushed to make an ounce of the colour purple. But silk coming in from, indeed, all the way to, from China, arriving into the eastern Mediterranean, not as a thin, transparent weave that we imagine and think about silk today, but actually as a much thicker weave, actually being unpicked and rewoven by workshops, workshops around the eastern Mediterranean coast in places like Antioch, 
Tyre, but also in Alexandria, and then being rewoven into the very, very thin, transparent, silk kind of gauze material that it was then being shipped out across the Mediterranean, particularly to Rome, where it was an absolute fashion hit. Now, it started, we hear, from the kind of moralists in Rome being worn principally by those uh, women of very much the lower orders of Roman society, prostitutes, because effectively it allowed them to be clothed but naked at the same time, the ultimate wet t-shirt competition. But very quickly, this tradition uh, caught on amongst even the elite, the respectable elite women of Rome. And we have tons of ancient Roman writers, all men of course, who are complaining bitterly about the fact that the, the wi Roman women are now sort of as naked as they are to their husbands on their wedding day uh, when they sort of go out, out and about around town and how disgraceful and disgusting this is. And it's not just the women because apparently the men started wearing this silk as well, not transparent making them naked but actually then colouring that silk and they'd add a little dash of coloured silk to their otherwise plain toga to give a certain je ne sais quoi and razzmatazz to their outfit um, and, and other, again these moralist people like Pliny uh, keep going on about the fact that you know we used to wear heavy hard weight hard hard working clothing that lasted and now we wear this flimsy expensive lightweight silk you know men aren't even men anymore because they're not wearing heavy duty clothing they want all this light fluffy stuff um, and so uh, over over time, the wearing of silk becomes an incredibly popular part of Roman culture, even though there's continued sort of approbation about it. Uh, it remains incredibly expensive. Uh, we know that sort of by the third century AD into the fourth century AD, a pound of silk is worth a pound of gold. I mean, they're effectively equivalent. Um, and increasingly, it becomes something that the emperor likes to wear because it justifies and demonstrates his dominion over uh, the worlds that he rules. So you have later Roman emperors like Honorius who are wearing jewels from one part of his world, silk from another part of his world, etc., etc., and so, so it goes on. But before that, uh, you do get uh, Roman emperors that are um, kind of very much told off for wearing too much silk, uh, and you also get Roman emperors. How dare they? People like Marcus Aurelius, who sold his wife's silk and gold clothing to pay for a war. I would not want to be a fly on the wall in the bedroom when they came to have an argument about that. Rebecca's asking, any, uh, are any, do any samples of this silk still exist? Yes, they do. Not in the Roman Mediterranean world, but back in Palmyra, we've actually found examples of surviving Chinese silk with Chinese letters on it and also Chinese emblems on it, uh, designed into the weave, um, surviving in the graves of Palmyrene. So Palmyra wasn't just some Palmyrians, Palmyrenes wearing um, Roman clothing and some wearing the trousers and caftan of the Parthian kings at their banquets. There would have been also Parthians wearing some Chinese silk as well, perhaps with a Chinese patterns, Chinese writing on. Others silks that have survived that seemingly having very much Central Asian patterns on of grape harvesting and things like that. So a really extraordinary cosmopolitan community. And then even examples surviving in the graves of Palmyra of woolen clothing that has been created to mimic, uh, in, in a cheaper cost of course, the silk alternatives. So there we go, kind of a really extraordinary cosmopolitan community. And that only starts to just scratch the surface of fashion in the ancient world. We are completely over time. I'm so sorry, we've run over time. Um, so we could do a little bit more, loads more on the Silk Roads in future Q&As. But thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Next time, 2nd of July, 2 p.m. Thursday, the 2nd of July, 2 p.m. We will be meeting for another live Q&A here on Facebook. In the meantime, I hope to see you for my lecture for the British School of Athens next Thursday, 6 p.m. UK time. Uh, and then also do check out on the YouTube channel uh, the different readings of ancient Greek drama and let us know your thoughts on my attempts to strut the stage, the boards. And do tune in next week for the Daily Dose 100 when I'll be bringing a little bit of Euripides Ion to life for you. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and let's hope that the rain stops very soon. Take care.